Hi. Welcome to the powerful tutorial of One Perception to Rule Them All, dedicated to language and vision. This part of my tutorial on the ICMR 2020 uh, being held virtually. My name is Xavier Giro, and I will provide you an overview of some of the most interesting application of language and vision that have converged thanks to deep neural networks. So please allow me to share the screen, and you can start with the overview. First, I would like to acknowledge my wonderful team with whom I uh, have been working on this field of the convergence of language and vision and doing my talk. While I would mostly cover work from other researchers, I would also uh, introduce the contributions that you have made in our team uh, basically on UPC in Barcelona. So I, my background is on computer vision, okay? And my interest in the convergence of language and vision uh, somehow started after a talk by Andrew Carpari in CPR uh, 2016 in Las Vegas, in which basically he uh, gave the cheap or the ideas that uh, the computer vision committee should pay a lot of attention of uh, what the machine translation committee was doing, okay? And at that time, there were kind of the early stages of the introduction of deep learning in computer vision. And I think that what uh, he was telling us that uh, he, that both committees were starting to use the same tools and that would uh, drive us to many exciting uh, new applications and synergies between the two communities. So I have structured my talk uh, trying to follow like this dual vision. So my background is in computer vision. So I'll probably be biased towards that, but I'll do my best also to uh, reflect how the people in language can see this uh, convergence of uh, language and visions thanks to deep learning. So I will first cover some works or some applications basically in which we generate new data. That will be this first part. Then another second part in which what we do is we discriminate between um, data that we kind of already have. It would be like the most classic uh, discriminative task uh, that we normally use in machine learning. And then at the end, I will talk about uh, the venues for representational learning when we have both vision and language. And finally, like some small uh, briefly pointers to control tasks, which I think that they seem to be like the, the next uh, big steps into this convergence. So let's start with generative models. And actually, I will start from the beginning and where this conversion between vision and language started. And it was basically to generate text. So the basic idea is that we will have some visual information, let's say an image, and we'll encode this information into a representation and then decode it as checks. And there is the text that we will generate. So these were the basics of the first uh, works on image captioning in which basically the uh, success of commercial neural networks into encoding images for image classification, it had been seen with AlexNet for uh, predicting uh, chats between uh, or class, classes actually uh, among 1,000 classes on ImageNet. And instead of just, uh, let's say, mapping the image into a 1,000 dimensional vector, one hot encoding output, now what we have is we encode the image, but we extract a sequence of of words, so that's a uh, we generate language out of the visual representation that is encoded on the CNN, and there were like some a uh, couple of or a few works that uh, were published at the same time. So there was this work on show and Chell, and also this other work from the Berkeley team and actually Andrew Garpati himself, and they were more or less, they were following the, the same approach. We encode images with commercial neural networks to the commercial neural networks, and then the representation we decode it with our current neural networks, which was a, a technique that had been uh, successfully applied, especially in the machine learning uh, field at, at that point, okay? That was the, the big revolution in language at that point was in translation, and it was the idea of uh, encoders and decoders from a source language into a target language. So the idea here is like, Let's uh, replace the encoding of the source language by the encoding of a mean, an image and then decode uh, the, the caption. 
There was also another work that was uh, quite uh, interesting, actually, like also followed the, the same trend that machine uh, translation was following. So at that time, after the basic encoder and decoder for machine translation, there were the attention models were introduced. So that basically the idea is that in, in translation, in language translation, uh, what you would say is like at, when we generate words at the output, uh, we would like to focus, to attend to some of the of the of the words at the input. So instead of just encoding the whole sequence into a single vector, we allow that at decoding time, um, the decoder has access to all the words encoded at the input. And maybe um, they don't need to be aligned, the words between themselves. And actually, maybe some of the output works uh, between one source language and another one, they are com they are combination. So it's it was nice to to be able to attend to different of uh, and then of the input words when decoding the the target language. So same idea for images here. Uh, the idea is that now when we are going to be generating the caption, uh, we will kind of allow or facilitate the, the the decoder to attend to focus on different parts of the input in image. So now what we have, we have the image, we encode it with CNN, and now at this at this point, what you see like these heat maps, they represent the different attentions that the decoder uh, decides uh, automatically um, in order to uh, predict the sequence, to generate the sequence of, of words that at the end will generate the, the caption, okay? So this kind of, uh, uh, if, if we visualize the attention maps uh, at the output, like in some cases, it was possible to, to see some kind of relation between uh, the decoded words and the attended areas. So there has a little a bit a lot of, of discussion if that's a good way for interpretability. But at least what it's for sure true is that uh, the decoder just looks at different parts of, of the image at, at different types, time steps at, at the output. More recently, and also following the progress that language has had in machine translation, which basically uh, there was a big revolution one a few years ago. There was the transformer model that it was at, it was uh, on this paper called uh, attention is all you need. But basically, what it was doing it was removing the recurrence C that had until that point it has been had been very uh, popular and, and broad in many language uh, applications, and it, and it just kept like the the attention, not at the output and the input and on the output. So that means that when we are predicting uh, words now. Uh, we are aware, we are, can attend to all the words on, on, on the uh, input and as well and all the predictions that we're doing at, at, at the output, okay? And so this, again, this scheme, if you apply to images, uh, that brought uh, some gains also for image captioning. And that's, that you see like the, the first message that uh, Andrew Carpati was saying, like uh, vision people, you should be looking at what, uh, Machine translation community is doing. Uh, it still applies also uh, this year, 2020, uh, with this paper from CAPR. So apart from this, maybe the the basic task of image caption. There are like many other tasks on that show the convergence between language and vision. For example, another one, and also now I'm now more like following the the trend that vision uh, took in terms of deep learning. So in from the vision perspective, uh, the task of image classification was the first one that was addressed. And then after one, probably what the next one was object detection. And if we would do image caption, like why not do it object captioning? And that's more or less what this world was doing. It was com combining uh, an object detector, but then generating captions for each of the detected objects that you can see here. There's a, there's a color mapping between one and another. So actually we, we had the chance with, uh, uh, my PhD student and my Salvador to, to test it um, on this live demo that, that these people on, from um, Stanford had. And she had like for me, and this guy over here uh, had uh, captions like man has short hair, man with short hair, so that's pretty good. For a Maya woman wearing a black shirt and both two men wearing black glasses, okay. Amaya for sure was, is a woman, but it's not that bad, okay. And it, it's, it's really good for a live demo in 2016. So we like the, the idea, and actually, 
probably since then we we start working on visual uh, vision and, and language and actually like a few years later um, I uh, had uh, this paper made together with people from Facebook AI in Montreal in which actually what we we're doing is, is we're generating recipes so we had uh, an image uh, actually we then go straight from the image to the recipe actually we first predicted the ingredients so we encode the image we decode the ingredients and then with all the ingredients we decode and the image features all together that's what we have here we have a decoder that generates the the recipes and here that you can see like this would be a, a, an example of one of the recipes that we generated with a chai child the ingredients instructions so all this structure it was kind of learned from the training data set and I would not say that, so I think we have never cooked any of these recipes, but they kind of look quite realistic for, for humans, not for expert cooks. So if you're working on this, I think there's still a lot of uh, work to do. Okay, something that I would like to highlight, and I think it's common in all fields of machine learning, but maybe in visual language, it's one of the most relevant ones. It's are the challenges that we have in the sense of uh, biases and data biases in this field. And there's one of these uh, uh, quite impactful paper, um, which actually they, they kind of observe that uh, because of the bias that we have in the data sets for captioning, uh, it was tending to uh, predict in, in some situations like one gender in favor of another. I would say that probably in most of the cases it, it was biased towards predicting um, male gender. So it's in, in this uh, photo. Uh, you see a person, it's really, um, you cannot determine if, if it's a man or, or, or it's a woman. And, but the, the, the model like by itself, it was uh, biased towards predicting the male gender um, words. And thanks to, to, their, uh, to their work, they uh, produce a, a system that kind of uh, try to actually predict how where it was focusing, where it was predicting this, this word. For example, in this case, it was really actually was focusing on the dog when predicting the, this word. And then by, by kind of uh, seeing where it was focusing and also trying to figure out if where it was focusing, it was possible to predict if it was a woman or a, or a man, um, it was possible actually to, to reduce these biases. So here you have kind of the, the details. And in general, as you will have the slides online, you can always uh, in, always click on the on these links and get the the details. But basically, they were kind of uh, introducing a loss that was um, they was trying to predict if it was feasible to 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 identify the gender of the uh, of the person, and that was trained by uh, occluding the persons in the in the data set. And this way, they they managed to have um, more neutral or less biased captions. Okay, following the trend on computer vision, the next stage for uh, captioning, actually that was also in the early times, it was for video. So the same as you, you can consider that images are a sequence of, um, sorry, the videos are a sequence of images. We can also encode the visual features of the video and then decode them to predict uh, sequences of words that may uh, caption the, the activity in, in a video. Actually, from the machine learning uh, community, so this comes more from the language community, um, there was a task uh, at that time that uh, caught a lot of attention of trying to have uh, something called multimodal machine translation in which what uh, the task is like given a, a sentence in one source language, so in, in English, a brown dog is running after the black dog uh, to translate it into other uh, languages like in German, or in French or any other uh, language and kind of try to figure out if by providing an image uh, related to the to the source sentence the there would be an improvement in the in the output translation okay so I think that results were not very encouraging but if you are interested you can uh, look at this uh, task and how uh, the, the, the words that were done to around it Actually, in a more general um, perspective, there was this uh, recent paper from this year, and they were trying to provide like a, a, a unified uh, view for the machine uh, translation task, considering both uh, vision, text, and speech 
and also suggest that you look at it if you are interested on, on this task. So one specific type of uh, language that is especially challenging and, and interesting when combining the textual language and, the, uh, and visuals is a language, okay? And in sign language, there have also been uh, a lot of progress thanks to deep neural networks. Um, so basically there were, there were uh, works that uh, combine the extraction of CNN features together with uh, recurrent neural networks and then recurrent neural networks with attention. And as you can imagine, like the nowadays, the state of the art, it's when doing kind of the same thing, but introducing transformer architecture as a new architecture. So also at the same, again, following the same track that uh, machine translation, language machine translation classic has been following. Another task related uh, to this would be like lib reading. Uh, there's this works from, um, I think Oxford uh, people, a few of them that were, uh, that kind of combine uh, the analysis of videos. So here you can see the, the lips, maybe you can read what she's saying. I cannot actually. And the idea here is that uh, they have the, this network that by looking at the lips, having a crop over the lips, it was possible to predict somehow the, the, what the person is, is uh, speaking. So this would be like the architection that was proposed at that time. Uh, so you see that uh, commercial networks to encode the video frames. And then in this case, um, a GRU um, to, so an RNN to predict the, the words. Uh, later, there was this also this work uh, from also Oxford and, and DeepMind in this case, in which they made it a bit more challenging by trying to uh, do lip reading in the wild. So they also release a data set. And when you see that the results are not that bad, so actually I, I'm not playing the audio, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, you can actually, uh, the, art, the, the task is actually doing quite a, quite a good job. So if you look at the model, actually, if you look at the paper, you will, you will see that they, uh, in the architecture, they have the visual features that will be for the lips. They have the decoder here with a, so this, uh, decoder is an, uh, an LSTM with attention. And also, they also fit the model with audio features, but actually in the, in the results, they provide ablation studies with and without the other features. And when you fit the other features, results are much better, of course, because then it's kind of a speech recognition task. And, and now in that case, it's more like that the visual part is helping the speech recognition, but they also provide uh, results with visual features only. And these results, they are, okay, they are kind of promising, let's say, and, and it's a good place to start from. Hmm. Another application that it has attracted a lot of um, uh, works, it's the task of, okay, when I do image captioning, uh, I would like um, to know um, which pixels are referred in the caption. That's called the grounding. So it means that if I have um, an, an, uh, 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 this descendant, so I feel like, uh, and I predict cat, I would like to know that that when the cat corresponds to this cat, okay? So when I have a, a captioning. And that's this work, uh, in this particular work, what they were doing is they were first, they were detecting the objects. And then as they were generating the uh, caption, they were looking at uh, which of the objects was um, mostly, a, let's say, attended or kind of help into the predictions. And you can, by doing that, it's possible kind of to ground the instances, the objects that are uh, mentioned in the, in the generated captions with the pixels that appear in, in the image. <clears throat> there was also, there have been a, quite a, a few words, but what I would like to highlight from this work is in this work, they, for training the model, um, they didn't use, um, bounding box annotations or any local annotations. And actually what it, they were doing is they were, uh, the, the annotations were like just at the, they had the captions at the, at the global scale for the image. And at inference time, um, it was possible to predict with a kind of, with a heat map. Here you have 
uh, highlighted with a star the maximum of the hymna. So for each of the words that are predicted, you can look at the maximum. In this case, so a man pred predicts to this uh, sir here. Uh, when the word red, it kind of the kind of the attention map that they built, it's centered around the, the the red uniform of this person. And motocross, uh, it's over here the the bike. And th th this localization, this weak localization of of the of the concepts mentioned in the captionings, it was trained uh, without local notation. So it's that's kind of a weak supervision that made it super interesting. <clears throat> okay, this will be uh, just an overview of some of the tasks that you can uh, have when you are generating text or predicting sequences of text uh, from uh, images. Now let's go the other way around and let's see uh, how can we generate images from text. Okay, so now input is text, output are images or, or some visuals. So one of the uh, first works to address this task is uh, a work based on GAN. So now, uh, again, we must go back to 2016. It was uh, the beginning of, of GAN, so generative adversarial networks that you probably have seen that they are able to generate synthetic data, which looks very realistic. And at that point, there was already some work that was generating images conditioned with the object class. And then, so these authors, what they what they wonder is like, why don't I encode a description of the object that I want to generate? In this case, they took a data set of, of bears. And here you see on top the description that they had. So this small bear has pink breasts and crowns and black primaries and secondaries. And with this, the presentation by encoding this description, you can condition the generation of uh, new images. And that's, you can see the result you see below. They, maybe they don't look super realistic, but they kind of match more or less the, the description that, that has, I suppose, on, on top, okay? And as I mentioned earlier, the idea here was to have a generative adversarial network. So we have the, the description of the object you want to generate. In this case, it was, they also tried with flowers. So this example is on flowers. They encode it, they add some noise. They can get noise to the encoding of the of the language, and then with that they uh, condition the generation of an image, and they train with the discriminator. Also notice that in the discriminator, uh, it was also important that the discriminator also had access to the language descriptor, so the, the description of the of the of the caption, so that it would be uh, could make a better task into assessing if the generated image, apart from being realistic, if uh, it was matching the, uh, the description of the object, okay? Because if you don't condition with this here, it, the description would just tell you if the image is realistic or not. So uh, quality improved uh, some one year later, I think, uh, with Stagan, so that was an, an, quite an improvement on the quality of the generated images. So you see that it had like two stages, but you should look at the, the stage below in which, uh, in this case, the, the, the idea of, of the birds. In this case, the bird description is a small yellow bird with a black crown and a short black pointy beak. Okay, if you look at the images below, I think they really match pretty well with the description and they look quite realistic. Uh, a little bit Later, just one evolution of, of this work is uh, there was this other work called Mirrorgan, in which what they did is, apart from uh, generating the image, they, they kind of uh, introduced some cycle consistency. So from the image, image that was generated, um, the caption uh, description was also generated. And then there were there, it was possible to define a loss term also between the input uh, description and the description or the caption, if you want, that you generate from the synthetic. Uh, image. So this, this idea of cycle consistency, I'm pretty sure you have seen it as well in other works. So now it was applied in, for this task. And it can help, of course, uh, if you are trying to address this, this problem. Here you have more examples of uh, obtained with mirror grain. Uh, the row you have at the bottom, these are the ground truth images. So these are real images. The images you obtain over here on mirror grain, they are synthetically generated. And when you have on top 
are the the descriptions of the bird. So now let's just read the, the last one. So this one doesn't look that realistic. Uh, it says a skier with a red jacket is going down the side of a mountain. Okay, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't look super realistic, but it totally matches the the description that that it's presented here. Some other works on image generation. What they did um, is so they observed that they could help the task of, uh, in this case, of Stagan. So if I have a sentence, in this case, the image is not that nice as, as with the birds. But if they introduce an intermediate step, uh, so a tool called uh, SyncGraph, that kind of what it does is it extracts the entity. So given a text, it extracts the semantic entities and the relations uh, by feeding that uh, into the generator that improve the, or make the task easier for the visual generator. So in this case, uh, the results were look much more realistic and especially when composing objects. Also in this idea of uh, generating images by composition, in this other work in text to scene, what they did is like, um, they given a, a description of the image you want to, um, to, to generate. Uh, there was a there was a kind of a recurrency, a recurrent model in which what he was kind of predicting step by step different objects on the over the image. So you see it's a sequential task, and the, this prediction it's conditioning the prediction of, of an, another object and then another object, and another object, and once like different patches have been generated, uh, there was a last step that was kind of filling the the, the blanks. Uh, also, in terms of video, there was this work that uh, so it's not directly generating video pixels, but it, what it's doing is like let's say given a description of a sequence in this case of a of a cartoon, uh, it were spotting the um, keywords that were important, and then given a data set of uh, these cartoons, it was retrieving the different parts that were that were mentioned. For example, Fred is this character, Red Hat. You have you can see a red hat over here. Then once the the composition, the raw composition is made, then uh, there was a fusion, a, late, a later fusion with uh, the right background. And also going back to sign language because I'm quite interested on on this field. Uh, there was also the the task of generating sign language. Actually, uh, in this case, pixels were not generated. What it was generated was a sequence of poses. So given a, a sequence of, of words, that's what you see um, over here, um, a sequence of poses, kind of breaking the, the sign language was uh, introduced. In this case, uh, like two things to highlight, uh, transform architecture was, was, was used as in, as in the earlier when I talked about sign language uh, translation. And also there's a SQL consistency so actually uh, what they did is they generated the, the poses and in order to evaluate if the generated poses were correct, they, they took the other model that they had because they are the same authors of the sign language translation and they, and they translated it back to the source and by doing that, they could train the model for post generation. Okay. Um, then with this, I'll close this first part of generative models. I'm pretty sure they are like many other charts, but I think that gives you an, an idea of, of the possible things that you can, how you can produce new text or new images uh, with the other modality. Let's look now at the, at the what if I, I'm not actually trying to produce new material, but I'm trying to solve kind of a classification like task with discriminative models. So now I will first start with this setup in which we have as an input uh, visuals and language and a, a discriminative task, it's uh, defined over text. So here the, the big star task, uh, the first one that kind of uh, followed this approach was visual question answering. Uh, so in this task, we have a question that the question uh, in order to be answered, uh, ideally uh, you would need the image, okay? And I'd say ideally because actually, um, 
the, this data sets and tasks has evolved in time because at the beginning, it, it actually it was seen that there was a lot, a lot of bias in the first versions of this task and the, the results, quantitative results, they were not representative enough, okay? I call it discriminative task because most of the systems that address, have addressed this task at the output, um, what they have is a, is a predefined set of answers and then each answer is a class. So let's say they took the training data set, they took the 1,000, 2,000, whatever thousand amount of uh, most frequent answers and then they address the task as a classification task across all the possible answers. Uh, so we address this with uh, two bachelor students actually at that time. Um, and basically like we just, th th this, this, it's not that we propose that, everybody kind of you, uh, uh, follow the same approach, but yes, now extract visual features, extract uh, language features, and then I somehow combine them. And here, that's maybe that's the, the, the difference between the different solutions that you will see to this problem. It's how the visual and language features are combined, are merged, so that at the end, you will predict the, the, the answer to the question. So for example, in this, in this uh, work, they were uh, doing some, uh, they were extracting some um, code from the representation from the, from the question, and then they, do, they did some hashing over the, the, the pixels, and at the end, to at the end, of course, provide the, the answer. But as you see, the answer is uh, represented as a kind of a softmax task, okay? At that time, that was uh, one of the state-of-the-art models. I would, also, I would like also to highlight that uh, some uh, this work, it also introduced something called dynamic memory networks for, the, for this task. Actually, they, they were addressing both question, uh, so non-visual question answering and visual question answering, so text question answering and visual question answering. And apart from uh, the classic CNN and RNN, uh, CNN encoding the RNN decoding, um, for this part, for the visual question in part, they also had uh, some memory uh, that allowed uh, to improve the, the results. So um, at that time, um, some authors thought that in order to address this task of visual question answering, maybe instead of having like a large data sets of, uh, of natural images and trying to collect questions and answers for that, uh, why not trying to narrow down the question and have a data set of, of, of an, or actually a render engine. You can think that it's kind of a simulator, right? That would generate images uh, together with questions over that images. And that's the kind of, that's where the, the clever uh, data set engine was born. And now you see that all the questions now uh, are like, are there an equal number of large things on metal spheres? So that's, these are questions that, that it's really hard to have a bias in the data set, or at least you can control it. And by doing that, it's, it's easier to measure if there are progress in the, in the visual understanding of the questions and, and the answers. So there have been many solutions for that. I will not explore all of them, just as a reference. Uh, the same uh, authors, they propose at some point to, to uh, first try to generate a program. So try to generate some pseudo code that was later executed to, to do the reasoning. Or there was this other work from, from DeepMind that what they were they doing is they were kind of uh, building representations for each pair of possible objects. And then by, by considering like each possible pair and, and, the, and the question, uh, they kind of somehow solve the, the task of, of classification on over the questions, over the, all the possible answers, basically. Okay, the next, so uh, apart from doing this visual reasoning, that was the next step after visual question answering, like uh, another research direction that came after visual question answering is like, why not, why, why just limiting to one question, right? Why don't, why don't, uh, engaging into a dialogue about the, the image. So here, we, what you have is uh, you have a, an image, you may have a dialogue history, okay, and then a question. So now it's not just image and question, but you also have a dialogue quiz history. And then uh, if uh, our model now uh, will generate an answer, actually this, then this would 
this question and this answer would could actually go into the dialogue history and then even keep extending that dialogue a bit farther. And related to this, uh, if you allow me, I will highlight that uh, in ICMR, so the place where I'm presenting this tutorial, we have a demo on this on one application of visual dialogues in which uh, we have like a proposal to use this technology for um, for um, treating dementia uh, because there's a, something called the reminiscence, reminiscence therapy that is actually uh, the idea is just to show images to the patients, so patients in the maybe in the early stages of Alzheimer, and engaging with them in a conversation, so that brings them back memories. And this task, of course, nowadays it's done, let's say, manually. So there are therapies that speak to the patients and try to uh, evoke their, these memories. And we think that a nice uh, application of visual dialogues will be this one. And if you're interested, we encourage you to come our, uh, to the demo session on, on Wednesday and talk to Mariona Caros, who actually uh, did this work together with our colleagues from the Universidad of Barcelona. Okay, so that's kind of the outline of, of our system that we had. It was called Elizabeth. What we did is we show an image to our system, and then, um, sorry, we show images uh, from past experiences. Then we show uh, with all these data set of images that we show to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, the bot chooses one of the image and shows it to the patient. Then the patient, uh, there's a question about it. The patient will answer to that question. And then the, the bot just provides some feedback, some comment about the, the answer, and then poses another question, and then that is possible to engage into a conversation. Uh, we just made a, a slow scale um, study, but patients seem to like it, and they, they found it kind of natural. Also, just to finish on this part of discriminative, we also in our work group, we had another application that we could, could call, call of AI for good of language and vision. In this case, the idea was to help um, um, content providers of social networks uh, to moderate their, their content um, because there's one specific type of content called uh, memes that kind of combine uh, visuals and language. And some of them, some of these uh, memes, they are being used to spread hate speech. And it's really hard to detect that in a, automatically because it's uh, really, um, it's very multi model. There's uh, so many hidden ideas, cynicism, or, or it's really hard, okay? So we set a baseline there, and we actually saw that it's really hard, but if you wanna look uh, at it, you can check our, our paper and code as well. So that would be a first overview of discriminative task that you can do uh, when predicting checks. Uh, let's do the other way around. What if now we want to solve discriminative task over images? So now what we have as input, you will see that we will have like language and visuals or images, and then some uh, some output that it's kind of related to the image. So it has a, a it has a visual output. So for example, uh, one task would be like, uh, if what if I have a, an image and I want to detect an object, um, and I want to to interact or refer to the object in a natural way. And that's what language uh, allows doing. So for example, here you have a video sequence and with the query woman with ponytail running, um, it's possible to actually uh, detect and track the object. That's what uh, this work uh, did. And actually in this work, they, they kind of show that apart from being, it being that possible, you could actually uh, help like maybe if you have some tracker it's just tracking objects like woman or and, and that's it or objects without any description. If you have a textual description, linguistic description that would improve an existing tracker. And also it, they show that their model was managed to, to, um, to handle, let's say, uh, these are not occlusions like that appearance and disappearance of, of, of the objects. That's people from Amsterdam. Uh, also, like one of the latest uh, works on, on this idea of what if I have a query and I want for, uh, it's kind of a grounding, grounding task somehow, um, but in this case, um, what, what they do is they, they, they detect the objects as well. So they, what they're doing is we are mapping the, each 
components of the query into the objects of, of, of the scene. And again, the, the last, latest version, it's using uh, transformers over the, the objects and, and the language. Another work, uh, which it's not on grounding, but it's more like on uh, the object detection and, and segmentation, actually, in, in this work, it's called MATNET. So there's a, a data set. So what these authors did is they took a, an existing data set. So Coco, maybe you have heard about it for uh, vision objects. And they um, built referring expressions. So uh, linguistic these expressions for the objects on, or many of the objects in the data set. And it has, in that data set, there are like bonding boxes. So you can do uh, object detection. And there are also segments, segmentations. And then they provide, uh, they built a, a network, and that's the network that they built. So actually, it was composed of, of three different uh, models that were trained separately. One of them, it was uh, mostly focusing on, on the words, on the subjects. Another one was kind of focusing on, on spatial relations. Another one on relations between objects. OK, so they kind of uh, trained that separately. And they obtained very good results for, for the task of given an, an expression, uh, generate the bounding box or the segment of, of the object. Later, there was uh, an extension to video uh, of this same idea. Yeah, so the same, the same task, OK? So have a query that describes a, an object. But now the object, as there's video, um, we can, so from one side, it's possible to exploit the temporal consistency, uh, so track the object across video frames. And also now, maybe some of the expressions, they can refer to, to motion, which makes it can make it uh, more challenging. In that sense, in our lab, uh, we address this task as well. And the first, we've done different things here. The first thing that we did is we uh, consider video as frame by frame separately and, and fit in through MATNET, OK? And then if you have this, let's say, this first frame with an image, there's a there's a here there's a woman on a horse okay you say the woman on top of, of the horse and then magnet, magnet would provide you the mask for uh, for the for the object or the horse on the water magnet could provide you a mask a dog could provide you a mask okay and now what we did is then we fit that into a, a video object tracker uh, some video object segmentation engine that we we had developed in our lab which is called Arbos, that actually uh, tracks the objects across the rest of the video sequence. But in this case, it was initialized with a, with a mask that was generated by, my, by MATNET uh, based on referring expressions. Actually, we have improved the, the model. And nowadays, what we have is a model that is state of the art for uh, different benchmarks for both still image referring expression segmentation and, and video object segmentation. Uh, that's called RefBoss. You can see it on, you can find it on archive and the source code is there as well. Basically, what we have done is we took like the state-of-the-art model, one of the state-of-the-art models for object segmentation, that this DBLAP3. We took the linguistic representation state-of-the-art from BERT and we just um, concatenate them and, and multiply them. And that's it. And with just uh, one last one, uh, one by one convolutions. Uh, we managed to uh, obtain very good results. Okay, actually, most of the work it's not on the model; it's more on analysis of the data sets, uh, because we observe or we detect is that the existing data sets for these tasks have some many some many limitations. So, if you look at the at the preprint, you you will find these limitations and the solutions that we we propose for that. Here, you have some results of of our model. As you can see, if you have uh, Oh, I didn't put the language. OK, yeah, sorry. Here, so that's the input image. And the language query, you have it on top. If it says, like, man on far left of the screen, you can see it's detecting this man. So there's some mistakes here in this one, because you see there's also some wrong detections over here. But it says, like, main guy on the TV. In this case, it's having a, detecting the, the, the man here on center. Oops, sorry. Or here, if you say woman in blue, it correctly segments that woman. Say guy on, guy on right, it currently segments the the share on the right. So this work uh, was developed by Miriam Medve. And also related to this task, 
uh, when we address the, the task. As I mentioned, we saw that the existing data sets have uh, many limitations. So in many cases, they were not readdressing really the task of preferring expressions because the ref maybe the, the, the referring expression, the language was not really mm, discriminating between objects in, in, in the scene. Maybe there was only one object in the scene, and then the task was kind of not ill posed. And when we realized that there were a lot of uh, problems in, in the existing data sets and we clean it up, then we had we don't have that much data. So and with and as in deep learning it's important to have a lot of data. What we did is we we took an approach that some other people have done in, in other fields as well, which is like to generate uh, synthetic data. In order to do that, what what we exploited is to we look at scene graphs. I think I, I mentioned that earlier uh, in that work that was improving the generation of, of images. So scene graph, they, they detect the uh, objects and the relations and also the attributes of the objects. And what we did is we, we run the, this uh, out of the shelf scene graph model from the, uh, over the video frames. And then we, as we had, la, then we had the, the entity name, so the, the dog, and we also have like attributes uh, both special or bigger or whatever, uh, we kind of built some handcrafted rules to generate uh, many synthetic expressions, like for each object. So it's here, like for one, uh, the same object, we have like, in this case, like six different referring expressions that we can generate um, automatically and for free with zero annotation cost. And by doing that, we managed to improve the results that we had obtained. Cool. Um, then the Let's address the last big block of, of this part of the tutorial, which is based on representation learning. So now the goal is not to, to predict language from vision or vision for language or vision or language, but actually the goal is to learn some representations which that will be useful typically for another task. Okay. And let's look at them. So, um, the use of deep neural networks for uh, joint learning representations actually dates back from quite a long time. It has received, nowadays probably it's the, the main focus of attention, but it has been uh, looked for uh, quite a long time. So there was this work called uh, Device in, already in 2013, in, we, in which actually what it was done, it's as um, given that we have um, a language model, at that point that we're using Skigram language model that you that you uh, train with a large amount of, of, of text, maybe the Wikipedia, I'm not pretty sure what they use here. And we have like a, another data set that can be uh, trained for um, image classification. I think they use kind of a, an image net model or something similar at that, at that point. What is possible, like as uh, in some cases, the, the label of the image class is, is also part of, of, of the language. Uh, we can kind of uh, kind of force that the output of the of the visual model it's not just a one hot encoding of, of the of the class that we want to predict but what we want to do is we can force that the output of the image model by kind of transforming uh, the, the representation learn at this point kind of matches the same um, representation that it was learned from with the language model Okay, so we just uh, make them kind of kind of match. Um, if we do that, then uh, what it's really nice is that, uh, and, and we train, so th this is the same. So with, with this kind of, we initialize this, so we pre-train this, we pre-train this, and now we kind of uh, fine tune or add some, some more training into, into these stages. So now, what it's nice is that if there was a, a, a word that it was contained in the, in the language model, but it was never uh, labeled on the, on the image data set that we use to train this part, um, actually now this word, as, it, as it's in the language model, we can fit it in, into the model here, and it will generate some representation. And this representation allows uh, actually, as, as representation is the same space as the representation that we also use for image, it that would allow to even uh, 
let's say, retrieve uh, images whose representation is very similar to uh, this object that was never labeled here. Okay, I think I'll go to the to the next example. Otherwise, it's, um, otherwise it's too complicated to explain. So that allows what's called zero shell learning, which basically means that I can detect uh, some classes that for which that my model has never seen, or or in particular, uh, my I can detect some objects on my images, even if the model, even if my data set for visual uh, learning does not contain an example of that. So this will be, this will be the example. Imagine that uh, we have a manifold of known classes that are trained with, let's say, ImageNet, okay? So you have the training images, that's everything you have here, and we built a, a manifold, okay? Not track, okay? but the ones that are in the manifold. But that in our training images data set, there are, there are no images for cat at all. There's, there's nothing there. But in our language model, we do have the word cat and we have the word track, okay? So as they are in the language model and we learn uh, a join embedding, a join representation for the, both the language and visual part, what we can do is like, uh, if we have the word cat, we can really uh, find representation over here for cat, and if at some point I find an, I have a, an image of a cat that even if it was never at training time, okay, but if at, te at test time I have an image of the cat, maybe when I feed it through this channel, this image, it's likely uh, that it, it that this representation uh, lies close to the linguistic representation, the word representation of the word cat. So, and if now from this point, we do like nearest neighbors uh, search to find the, the right class for this image, it could actually in the end predict that it's a cat, okay? So the way how this would be kind of predicted, it's like, let's imagine that, uh, that, um, that in the, if we assume that visually cats and logs, they are kind of similar. And if you, and if you don't agree, just think about tigers, okay? But the point is that we have images of dogs uh, in our data set. So we have a way where they are encoded. And also that dogs and cats, in, when we look at our text um, data set, so when we look at whatever they said we use here, Wikipedia or whatever, the, wor the words dog and cat, they kind of appear in similar context. It makes sense that the representations, they are, they lie together. So it, it's possible that if apart from dogs, you, 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 you use, there are like other concepts which are related to cats that appear in, that which are visually, uh, sorry, which they appear in similar, in similar uh, concept. And they also have like some visual similarities. It's possible that this may work at some point. It's not that it's always going to work, but it's a solution at least. And this allows zero, zero shallow learning. So these are like two different works, but as you can see, they, they were appeared in the, the same conference. Another practical application, which maybe it's, it's, has been more successful, it's multimodal retrieval. So if I have a large data set of uh, images and captions, okay, and I, I can uh, totally, uh, and they are paired, okay, I can learn a joint representation so that whether when I feed the image or I feed uh, the caption of the image, the, I project everything into the same position of uh, our multimodal space. And if I do that later, I can do, I can, if I have, let's say if I have an image, a new test image and I have a large data set of captions, I can retrieve uh, the caption in my data set that best matches my test image or the other way around. If I have, uh, or the other way around is I have a new caption that, and I have my large data set of images. So maybe I want, I, I run my search on a search engine. I describe what I want. And then what I can do is I can encode my description through a language uh, encoder and then retrieve those images that are most similar to the to the encoded representation on this multimodal space and that's kind of a, an approach that there are there's a, there's a huge amount of of uh, literature on on this approach so apart from being so one of the literature that I will highlight is is this work in which they, they run this uh, multimodal retrieval uh, task uh, 
with different, um, so here you have like a, a query and now, now like have, it's a thin, uh, kind of synthetic image, I think that it's, and then you have like, you can uh, retrieve real images, clip parts, and more interesting, that's, that's where language uh, is involved. Uh, here, it, here it's right, special te text is like here it's right, cabinet, door, wall, wall, which is kind of a special distribution of, of the words or actually like uh, descriptions, like everything you would could need to make dinner, all the in one place, not quite the size of a full kitchen. So in this work, what they did is they built a data set of uh, natural images, sketches, clip art, special text, and descriptions. So special text is, is this one that I was mentioning. And what they, they project everything, uh, all, all the representation. So they, they learn an encoder for each type of data and they, they did the training so that all the representation would converge into the same uh, point at space. And by doing that, you can retrieve one from another. In this idea, and actually uh, also a work from uh, our former PhD candidate, Amaya Salvado, at, when she was at MIT, she did uh, this task for uh, recipes. So at the beginning, I talked about recipe generation. Actually, uh, chronologically earlier, what she had done is recipe uh, retrieval. So given an image, uh, she learned some joint embeddings between the images and the ingredients and the cooking instructions. So given an image, you can retrieve an existing uh, recipe instead of generating it. That's a difference with respect to the first example that I provide. So what she did is uh, she just projected the images into the same representation of the ingredients and the cooking instructions. And by doing that, uh, it was possible just, maybe you have uh, some, some recipe and you want to have ideas for presentation of the dish. That's something you could do with, with this work, this approach. Okay. Um, then another uh, recent work also, now I'm kind of changing a bit the topic, which is like, what if I, I so this has been a lot of effort lately in really having very good representations that uh, are good pre-trained representations for other downstream tasks. And now I'll, I'll just go through uh, some, some, of, some of them. Um, in this case, in this work, what they did is they learned uh, visual representations. Okay, so they wanted uh, very good, rich uh, visual representations. And what they did is in order to train it, they, they, they had like a data set of images and captions of the, of the image. And what they did is they uh, mask some of the word of the caption and they turn a network to predict the missing word, okay? If you are, probably you have heard about this idea because that's the basics of many language uh, model tasks. So language models, if you are from the vision part, are uh, this, um, let's say neural networks, okay? That what we have do, we have trained them by, by uh, some self-supervised task which means like if I have like a lot of textual data, I invent, I come up with some task that I can uh, automatically generate and ask my network to, to complete. And the, one of the classic tasks is just remove one part of the data, would be like masking one word and then asking the, the network to predict it. By doing that, and that's not, maybe I can play the video now, uh, what they were doing is like, so they have child, they, they mask it, and they learn uh, very good uh, predictions for the for the representation of the of the of, of the image and the, and the objects. Similarly, um, at a much larger scale, and then dealing with uh, video, uh, there were like a few works uh, last year on, on this. This one is called Bilbert. Maybe it's one of the most popular ones. And what they did is they, they took this transformer network uh, that was trained with a language called, uh, then became the BERT model for language, which is one of the most popular models nowadays. And they, they look at how that this language model was trained and kind of adapted it to the case of multimodal in the sense of if I have like a sequence of uh, video frames and some uh, description, some captioning of, of that video. So now let's think about that. We have data set of uh, video, uh, sequences of video and a description of, of, of that. For example, in this example, there will be a, a video sequence. Here you have like a, 
one, two, three frames and a half, let's say. So here there will be a video sequence of a man shopping for something. Then what you see here in between, that would be the, this, the neural model, which was a transformer model. And the self-supervised task that they combine, or they, they adapt it from the original BERT model. Uh, from one hand is um, what they did is they, they, um, they mask, so they removed some of the, let's say, video frames. Okay, that will, it will be the visual task. So I remove this frame or this frame. And you ask the network to predict uh, the categories that would be detected in that frame, okay? As you have the whole video, you know the categories, so you can, gener you can generate your, let's say, your ground truth to compute your loss. But then at, when you train your, your network, you remove these frames and you ask the network to predict that. The network will predict that based on the context, basically, on the, on the story of the whole video sequence. And that's, that's kind of the idea of BERT is that these are representations that, that um, take into account a lot the context. So if uh, the idea of the original idea of BERT is that if you have a word, that word, it might, it will not, in many cases, it will not appear in isolation. It's, it's a word in a certain context. So now the same thing is like uh, when you have uh, visual frames, it's interesting that these visual frames, if you want to encode them, if you want to encode these representations, they are also aware of the context. You know, in, in the way to force the network to look at the context, it's to uh, define self-supervised learning tasks that force the network to look at the context. And, and one way to force it is just, okay, I remove, I totally remove this frame or this other frame, and I ask the network to predict which classes, which uh, semantic classes would appear in, the, in that, this missing frame. So not, not the pixels of the frame, but the, the object classes, okay? Because that's much easier to encode and to predict. And also they did the same for the language part. For the language part, they would, that was exactly the same as, as Bird was doing. So they just mask, mask some of the words. So, uh, so they, they mask these two words, but they, sh they show to the model the, the, vi the video sequence and some, and some of the words. And they ask the model to predict, for example, man, sh man shopping for uh, whatever. So that was one of the tasks that they use in, in Bilbert. Another task that it's also taken from the original language uh, model BERT. So in, in that, it's, uh, it's an alignment task. So in this case, what they did is they, they match um, video sequences with descriptions, with captions, okay? But at training time, some of them, they were matching, some of them, they, they weren't. And then the, they just trained the, the, the model. So, if, so after the representation you have here, you would uh, have a, a model that should predict a network that would predict if they are aligned or not. And of course, you can build as many training, training pairs as, as you want for that and, and learn very high powerful representations. So with that, they learn nice representations. And they did something similar in this other work. Now, and I'm, I'm changing works, but as you see, it's from the same year and they are similar stories. There's another work called Video Bird, and there were a few others. But for example, if you do that, uh, you can do things like if I have like a sequence of uh, descriptions of cooking uh, instructions, I can extract the representations that I learned with my whatever, Video Bird or Video Bird, whatever. And then if I have a data set of uh, video sequences, for which I, I can I have my representations as well. I can retrieve the video sequences, the frames that would match uh, these instructions. So here, here again, we are not generating video; we are retrieving video sequences to illustrate the different steps of these uh, cooking instructions. Some other works uh, they have what they have done is uh, exploiting the correlations between uh, captions and video frames to actually like learn uh, language from video. And in this case, they, this work from uh, Briso, from the Madaman's team, they learn uh, bridge representations to explain adverbs. And in this other work from uh, Columbia team, um, also fo former, former uh, students from our group at UPC, they learn um, 
kind of the meaning of words that probably you don't know. So if, if somebody tells you, yeah, yes, then I split the gi on the roti, I mean, probably you don't have no idea what it's like. But if you look at the image, right, you, you, we can always, many of us, if we didn't know what it was like, uh, we can probably um, infer that the gi must be, um, be refer to this sauce and the roti it must be like what the food that was already in Japan. Okay, so by trying to exploit these two correlations, you can build uh, nice representations for both gi and roti, even if we don't know it. But as we have some pixels there, that can, that can help us. Cool. Let's just address now the last part of those of this tutorial on language and vision, which would be like uh, which kind of what is going on on in the field of control task. And when I co say control, I kind of maybe some of you have heard about embodied AI. So uh, embodied AI is a field in which uh, you have an agent that is interacting with the environment. And this agent can follow language instructions. For example, they can follow instructions like go to kitchen, uh, which is as you, what you can see here. It's an example on a platform developed by Facebook called Habitat or instruction following. So turn around, go out of the bathroom, turn right, and go out of the brown door. So if you have a, sorry, and this is a body question answer. What color is the TV? It's dark blue. So which, in order to answer for the questions, uh, you, you need the act to the, an agent to take actions. That's why I call it like control task. And there's a lot of interest there. Um, there's this platform Habitat, and there are like a few others out there that are uh, trying to go beyond from what we have seen uh, so far in the, in the previous slides. Uh, one of these tasks that is most popular is navigation. So maybe you provide to your agent with some instructions on, for example, go down the stairs, go slide to the left, to the bottom of the door, go, go to and go through the door, take an immediate left, blah, blah, okay? And then what you would like is the, your agent. Uh, so at training time, what you will do is you will train a policy, so a neural network that um, will uh, issue actions. Uh, and these actions will, in this case of navigation, would uh, generate a, a motion of, of the agent in, a, in an environment. And, and the, the challenge here is how to, um, how to be very efficient with the training, because now, um, so every time, Every time you run an agent in a simulator, um, that's a lot of computation. So that's it's. So when we deal with training um, policies for control tasks, reinforcement learning policies, we must be very careful with the efficiency of the samples because they are kind of very. So the the, the level of supervision of reinforcement learning it's it's very sparse. It's it's very super sparse, and you need to take a lot many options before getting a, a reward, whether positive. Or, or negative. So here, I think I, there's kind of a conversion between the reinforcement learning and multimedia community here. I will, I will address this now as well. So for example, if you want to address this navigation task, there was this work from last year, just a, a, a general scheme. What you could do is you could take your instructions like work forward uh, once. So you encode the instruction. And now uh, you can, if you have like, say, a, an agent that has a video camera on top, similar, even if it's simulated, you feed your pixels onto, uh, on some commercial neural networks. Maybe in this case, they were just looking at the last four frames to have some notion of, of, of motion. They concatenated, concatenated them, uh, went through a fully connected layer, and by combining uh, the instructions with, uh, with the current observation of the, of the state, um, they had an LSTN that was predicting the next uh, action to take. So in, in this in this one, it was just move or stop. Okay, it was was a very easy example. But I think that here you, you have a uh, you can see a, you can see that the scheme is exactly what we have been what I've been showing you for all the other tasks. So we, I encode the language, I encode vision, and I issue in this case now. Okay, now this is an action. Okay, I, I write here move, but actually it's not. It's not just a word. It's a, it's an action that will affect um, the next observation. That's where things change, and that's where we get into the reinforcement uh, learning realm, which basically the main challenge is that the supervision is 
is is very very scarce. So normally, so here, this is a super example, a very simple example in which we only have like move and stop. But typically, typically in a real case, it will move like dozens of times before reaching somewhere. And if that somewhere it's the place where it's supposed to go, uh, okay. If you start doing random exploration, that you will never get there. Right? Chances are super slow. So so learning in reinforcement learning, it's much more challenging, especially if you are trying to to learn to train models like LSTMs that have a huge amount of parameters. In that sense, okay, there are many works, uh, but for maybe one of that I would like to highlight. So there's this work from Felix Hill from DeepMind. He's, they are in DeepMind. They are doing so many things. So for example, they they, they learn how to uh, the virtual environment to to handle and and move objects around, like put a plane on the bed. As you can see, they are training this on virtual environments. But again, like the, the ingredients is like a CNN for the visuals, LSTM for the language, and then somehow you will predict a policy, so some actions, and that policy will affect the environment, and then this is the, the classic reinforcement learning loop. So we reached the end of this powerful tutorial on language and vision, and I'll just finish it with kind of the same way how I started. Uh, at the beginning, I, I said that I was uh, inspired into getting into this language and vision field, uh, in part thanks to the, this, this uh, talk by Andrew Carpati saying, like, we should look at the, what the machine translation community is doing. And it has, I think, it was a very good point. And, and like four years after, it's, it, we can still clearly see a convergence on language and vision and some many people like trying to do multimodal task. Actually, if you are in this tutorial, you must be interested in this. So today, I think that we are in a similar situation, but for the control task, for the reinforcement learning uh, community. I think that uh, we as a multimedia community, we should also learn a lot uh, from them because uh, it's not that far away. It doesn't look that distant to have uh, some agents, some robots that may move around and we want to interact with them uh, through language because that's the most natural way of our interaction for us. And these agents will probably will want, we will want them to, to see what we see because that's the same way of, uh, of um, sensing the most our creatures sensors that we humans have. So I think that that would be a, a good, my tip for you if you wanna take some home message. So that will be it. Thank you very much um, for your time. Um, I hope that the tutorial was interesting. And please uh, see you if you are following this in the live session. See you now in the live sessions for the questions and answer. Bye.